Okay, all right. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about using helper resources to plan a lesson, and I'll actually walk through a lesson, which will be a lesson for growing a tree rather than descendancy. And so with that in mind, it's time for us with these beginner lessons to finally get to the point where we'll actually show a lesson. So we're gonna talk about having two things. We're gonna work with two things today, a tool, helper resources, and a process which is the discover, gather, connect, or really kind of a, a spin off of the find, take, teach system. So over time, you're gonna work with a lot of people and you're gonna to wanna to keep track of what you've done, not just done for right now, but because hopefully you're gonna work with them over a period of time, what you've done with them in the past. And if you use the helper resources system, it's a good way to be able to keep track of those old lessons, not just the new ones that you wanna give now, but uh, have a history of the old ones so that you know for sure what you've done in the past with people. So note-taking, record-keeping is really important in our calling. And I know I've, and I, I've sometimes have tried using my head as the record keeper, and that's the worst thing I can ever do. All it does is get me into trouble. And then we know that uh, paper has a bad habit of disappearing on us. And so it's, it's really nice that the church has provided us with the help or resources if we want to use them so that we have a place to store lessons and not lose them. Okay, so helper resources is the key. So this is the tool that we'll talk about tonight and it's been designed to help us in several different ways. It'll help us find discovery activities we can use with our patrons. It'll help us to see numerous ways to study their tree so that it, we can find where we want to work in their tree as the church has provided these things partly for the patron but then also partly for us so that we can know where it's more likely to be uh, useful to go into a person's tree to find names for them and also it provides us links with excellent training for our calling, in addition to going to lds.org or churchofjesuschrist.org. And then it also includes the way to create and store the lessons, as I've said. Okay, so helper resources, where are they found? We used to say go to help, but really help now is that little circle in the upper right hand corner of familysearch.org that has the question mark in it, that little icon. And when you click on it, then you see that help menu drop down. It's already showing there and helper resources is down at the bottom. And when it comes up, this is what it looks like. There's really two sides to it, the left side there and the right side. Now the left hand side has recent articles for Latter-day Saints, AKA recent articles for consultants, especially. And so it has links to things like what's new and all kinds of things to help you with your calling. And the right-hand side is where you will be able to add somebody. Okay, and then, um, once they're added, you'll be able to help them. Okay, so let's talk about that. When you wanna add somebody into the helper resources, what you wanna do is go over to that right-hand side of the page. And when you get them signed up, you'll then be able to see everything that they have that they can see as if you were them. Now, there's one thing about that that's tricky. 
it used to be that we could go in with say to help say let some older member of the church maybe who had never signed into family search or or church of jesus christ.org didn't have an account we could go in and be their helper even though technically they had never activated their account and we could do this also for young children well they've changed that and now if the person has never signed in to their what we call lds account their one user account their one account that works for everything then you're not going to be able to be their helper so you're going to have to get them to sign in first so that's one tricky thing to remember for some of us have been around for a while used to just say well it didn't really matter because we can still get in and see their stuff even though they've never seen it themselves okay so when you want to add a person you click on add someone now logic says you're helping somebody who's in your ward or at least your stake and if they're in your ward or stake you'll be able to look them up and get their name that way. If you're helping somebody who's not in your ward or stake, you would have to go and uh, put their name in the way they think the church says it is. You know, a lot of people go by nicknames. Like I've got Andrew Ott there. If we tried finding him with Andy Ott, I don't think we would have ever been able to pull him up because the church knows him as Andrew. So you gotta be careful about that. If you're not using the church directory name, which is their official church name, you're gonna have to find out you know, from them what their real name is, not the name they go by necessarily. Then you need two more pieces of information besides their name. One is their helper number. And nowadays that's become a lot easier to find. It's the last five digits of your membership. And most of us use tools. And if you go to your own name in your tools account, it'll give you your membership number right there. So you don't even need to recommend or need to have your recommend with you to know your membership number. That used to always be kind of a, a sticky question to ask because not everybody has a recommend. But now everybody that has tools can see their membership number. And if it ends in an A, that A is the fifth number or digit, I should say, and it needs to be capitalized. So like one, two, three, four, capital A, if it ended in an A. That's the one thing you need. Then you have an option. If they know their username, they can just give you their username. Or if they don't know it, you need their full birth date, day, month, year. And hopefully these things all match up with what Salt Lake has. And if it does, you'll be able to get in. Always remember if you're working with new converts, that's always tricky because we've got to get the ward clerk to get that or the, the person that puts in the, the baptism record, get that entered so they have an account. Because you can't really do any church stuff with them until their church account shows up. If they had a non-member account before they joined, you could look at their tree and stuff, but you're not gonna be able to do any reserving for temple work until they convert it over to the church account. Okay, so now that you've got it lined up, and the nice thing about going through it that way rather than sending the invitation is you don't have to wait for them to approve it. They will get a message that says so-and-so is trying to be your helper. If you don't want it, this is what you can do to stop them. But in the meantime, you'll be able to look at it, look at their stuff. So I'll go to Carolyn and I'll be able to start working with her. So now what am I gonna be able to actually do? Well, the fan charts, the real key to helping you decide how you're gonna help somebody in my estimation. 
And so I start with that and I expand it out to seven generations, which is as far out as it'll go. And this will give me a good interactive way of viewing the person's pedigree, several different ways, seven different ways. And in this, I will be able then probably to identify where I'm gonna to wanna to go. So with this particular person, it's obvious that their tree may be full for four generations, but starting with the fifth generation and on, there are holes here. And so this is a tree we probably are gonna be able to grow. Instead of doing cousins, we'll probably try to find an ancestor or two. Okay, whoops, I'm going backwards. Okay, now the second way that we can show this is to switch over to birth countries. With that, we're able to see where the people come from. And that helps you because if you're not comfortable doing research, let's say for the Falcon Islands, where there's one person up here from the Falcon Islands, I doubt you're gonna to wanna to pick that person to work on. Or if you're not familiar with Italy over here, you may be reluctant to go over here. So usually for most people, the blue is the United States. And I've always said in the past, you're smart if you can stick with the US because you'll probably find it the easiest area to grow. Okay, the next one is sources. Now you start getting a feel for how much work has been done. And you can see that that big wedge in the middle is pretty heavily used. And a good portion of the right hand little corner is fairly heavily used. Notice those three light colored, four light colored boxes in the bottom right corner pretty much correspond with people in Canada. Okay, and so, you know, you see how things kind of fit together a little bit. Okay, another one we can look at is stories. Stories are a good indicator of long time LDS lines. And you can start to get a feel for that. Photos, same thing, except you will find more photos even for non-member lines or the people in the, at least the, the newer generations. Research helps. This starts to tell you where things need work, where like hints are, and it's interesting, this has hints all over the place, but that bottom right and the bottom left have quite a few hints. And that bottom left has a lot of data problems. Those kind of reddish, brownish reddish boxes which are things that need uh, some kind of a, attention for data problems. And then ordinances. And this is where it really stood out. And I see a section of this tree where the people are in there and some of them are not that far back. They're my patrons, uh, great grandparents. And starting with them going back and I see a lot of green right away. And so as I look at this, the two areas that are the most likely to be places I'd wanna to go to would be the lower right or the lower left. And probably because of all the green ordinances needed, I'd probably start over here in the lower left and play around in here and just see what I could do in the way of of cleaning up all the needed ordinances. And hopefully there would be ordinances that the patron would be able to do. Okay, so now, once I've done that, I'm gonna wanna make sure I take advantage of the other things in the helper resources. After the trees coming down, the little menu on the left are notes. This is something a lot of us never pay attention to, but this is a place where separate from taking, uh, making a record for a lesson, you can just write a note. And I had one of the sister missionaries I was working with, 
she had a great grandmother, I think it was, or great great grandmother, Casimir Rodriguez. And they had some information on her. And when we went looking for her, we came up with the right father's name for her out of birth records in Mexico, but a different mother. And so I wrote out this note and said, you know, because based on the Social Security Death Index, which gave us the birth date for sure, matched up with a death date that the family agreed with, we felt that this person was actually misunderstood in their family or misidentified a little bit because the mother was different and the location was different. And so she needed to go back and verify. And it turned out that we were right, that uh, the woman wasn't born in Zetecas. She was born over here in this part of Mexico. And so this is a place where you can write notes that apply to whatever you're working with for the patron. Okay, then below that, is plans. And this is where you can actually use their form to create lesson plans and they'll be stored. You can print them out. You can download them and send them to the patron. The patron actually can't see these directly. You're going to have to either download it and send it to them or do a copy and paste. And we'll show you the one for the lesson we're going to do today. Okay. So let's actually go through a lesson. So one thing I wanted to bring up though, before we get into this very far, something that I've never mentioned in this lesson before and really should have, and that's this little issue of duplicates. As you work in tree, you've got to realize what you're going to try to do is add names but you're not able to add names while you're preparing the lesson. Because if you did that, then there wouldn't be anything for your patron to do. So you can't really put these people in a tree. And so what I try to do, because what you really ought to do is if you were doing this for yourself, is you would add a source that might bring in some new people. You'd immediately check them for duplicates add some more information to them, check them for duplicates again, as you're working in tree and growing the family. Well, we can't do that. But I know from past experience, trust me, if you don't check, you're gonna plan this lesson out and you'll no sooner get into it with your patron than as soon as you add somebody, up pops duplicates. And a lot of times you're going to find it's already done. And you sure don't want that to slap you in the face. You don't want that to happen. Now, a lot of times it is interesting. A lot of times, and you'll see it tonight, the people will be in tree. They'll come up as a duplicate. But it's actually great because they're in tree, but whoever put them in tree didn't, didn't assign the temple work to be done and they'll be ready to be done. You're gonna run into a lot of non-members trees or members trees where they didn't bother to uh, reserve the people. But to save yourself an embarrassment, what I do is I take a paper and I write out the family, putting the details on it as I go, like a family group sheet. And then every time I feel like it, I stop and go, run find in family search. If you go up to this to the tree, drop down on the ribbon, there's an a option of find, which is to search for a person. And I go through searching for each of the people in the family to see what comes up. And a lot of times what you'll find is you may also find where maybe a child's work was shown through a birth record or a marriage record, it'll name the parents. So the parents will be in there, but all they are is their names. No work's been done on them. And maybe for the child, the only work that was done was the ceiling. You'll see a lot of that kind of thing too. But please save yourself the embarrassment 
of going into this lesson and finding out there's nothing for your patron to reserve because it's already all done by doing as much checking as you can beforehand. Okay, that's just my tip for advice. So let's do a partial tree. We're gonna work on a, a tree situation where the tree is not full. So this was the tree of the patron that I was gonna work with. And you can see that little wedge in the bottom left corner is not complete. In that seventh generation, there's four people that have, that aren't in there. And then there's other people that don't have any sources. And so there, there's kind of a hole, it's a good place to work from. And so I just kind of said a little prayer and I said, okay, Lord, which person should I pick from out of this little section? And the name Jeremiah Ashby came to my mind, the one where that arrow was pointing. And so Jeremiah Ashby with no sources is going to be the guy that I'm going to work off of. Okay, so this is the information that was there. Jeremiah had a, a birth date, which is an approximation, 1855. You see Cutler, Carroll, Indiana in brackets. That means it's a guess. He died in, I love, I love how they do this in the Midwest, Mexico, Miami, Indiana. They couldn't make up their mind where they wanted to be. That's a classic. No date. Married in 1865 in Carroll, Indiana, so that county, to a Susan Dillman or Degman, who has an about birth date of about 1859, supposedly lived in Carroll, Indiana, no death information. They have one child, which is a child that's in the pedigree, Rosa Anna Ashby, born in 1881, 4th of July, no less, in Cutler, Carroll, Indiana, and died in 1943 in Knox County, Indiana. So now, if you look at this, I'll, I'll pause for a second, let you just look at it and, and in your own mind, draw some conclusions about what you're seeing here, issues or interesting things about this. Now, here's the first thing that came to my mind. If they're married in 1865, these parents are too young. Susan would be six years old. Jeremiah would be a ripe 10. There's no way they're that age. Their ages are off. There's something wrong there. Now, they married in 1865 and Rose's born in 1881, that's 16 years later. She's the only child showing in the tree. You're surely more children. I mean, it's possible, but very unlikely that they would have a child 16 years later and no other kids. And then the thing you can't see here is Rosa has no sources. Okay, so we really need something to verify that Jeremiah and Susan are her parents. Because I mean, that's a big leap of faith if there's no sources to show it, to tie her to Jeremiah and Susan. And there appears to be a problem. Now, according to this, she's born in 1881, which means she's born after the 1880 census. And doesn't show it here, but she's already married in 1900. So she's born supposedly after the 1880 census and married before the 1900 census. There is no 1890 or 1900 census. There is no 1890 census. So there's a possibility she's never gonna show up in our favorite tool, the census, because she's too late for one and she's gone by the other and the census in between, there isn't anything. Okay, so we're gonna have a problem. So let's start with Rosa 
and see what we can do. We have a full birth and death information on her. We need to verify it and along the way, see if we can tie her into a family. Well, the 1900 census, she's married. She says she's 22, which would put her back in July of 1878. And that's the year and date, month and year she has on the 1900 census. And it said she'd been married four years. She was the mother of three children, two were living. Her father was born in Indiana, her mother born in Indiana, or she was born in Indiana, her father in Indiana, and her mother in Virginia, which is something that doesn't agree with what we had in Tree. It said she supposedly was born in Indiana. In 1910, Rosa aged a whole six years which would now make her born about 1882. But it says she was born in Indiana and her parents were born in Indiana. So now it's starting to agree with what we have. 1920, she's aged 12 years, which would put her back to about 1880 for a birth year. Father in, or her in Indiana, father in Indiana, and her mother in USA. That's the good old uh, cop out for when we don't know. So I have a feeling Rosa didn't give this information. It could have easily been a uh, child in the family or even her husband. 1930, she ages 10 years and it's Indiana, Indiana, Indiana. It says she was 18 when she got married and knowing her marriage year, that would put her birth back to 1878, even though the census says she was born in 1880. And then the 1940 census, it says she was 61, which would put her in 1879. This is a classic census. And this is why you wanna have a whole bunch on people if you can do it so that you can get a feel for what's going on and you realize the issue in censuses of their being a little vague and hard to be absolute and get absolute information and it's good to have more than one. So the question still becomes, when was she born? And it's important because if she's born before 1880 or early in the year 1880, we should be able to find her on a census. So where did this information on her birth and death come from at the top of the page? Well, it came from this beautiful tombstone. And notice it's all carved in there, July 4, 1881, and so on. And of course, tombstones don't lie, right? Well, you gotta remember, as far as birth information goes, a tombstone is really a secondary source. The person that really would know or should know is Rosa and she's dead. And most likely the people that carved the stone or had the stone carved weren't there when she was born. So it's all working off a of hearsay. And then you have the issue of did the guy carve it correctly? Because there could always be errors in carving. So anyway, that's the source for the dates. But now let's see if we can do anything to resolve this. Her death certificates at Ancestry. It says Jerry Ashby's her father and her mother's Mary. Well, it's supposed to be Susan or Susanna. So that's a little bit off. That's an interesting thing to find. Now the dates agree on this with that tombstone. So we knew that we got the tombstone probably from this source. So let's see what we can do. Let's try 1880 census and see if we can find the family, whether she's entered or not. See if we can find Jeremiah and Susanna Ashby. And sure enough, in Carroll County, Indiana, we find Jeremiah and Susan Ashba without an Y, but an A instead but it's surely the family because look at that last child, Rosa, age one. 
and there could only be in that county, that family has to be ours. There couldn't be any others that would fit these things. Okay, with Jeremiah and Susan and Rosa. So Rosa really is a child, or there is a Rosa who's a child of Jeremiah and Susan, born about 1879, and she would almost have to be because this is the 1880 census. If her age was zero, we might have said 1880. But since she's one year old, she almost has to be born in 1879. Now, analyzing this, the last name, well, if we look at the original marriage record, it actually does show Ashba. So this record and the marriage record show Ashba but then after that, the family's going to use Ashby. Or on other records, the family's going to use Ashby. Ashby. It's, who knows? It could be that they didn't really care, or who knows what. But anyway, for this record, they're listed as Ashba. Now, Rosa had to be born before 1880 because she's here. And also, you notice there's a child, Julia, there, who really shouldn't be Susanna's or Susan's because she was born back in 1862, three years before Jeremiah and Susanna married. So she's probably a child from an earlier marriage. And because of the big gap in ages between Jeremiah and Susan, this is classic for a man's second marriage to marry a woman much younger in age. And so this makes sense that Susan is probably a second wife, but we would have to do some research to try to figure out who the first wife is. Okay, and we look anywhere else. Let's at least find a second source. Well, here's the 1870 census. Now they're going by Ashby. Now, of course, Rose is not there because Rose is not born till 1878 or nine. And so she's not in the family yet. That Julia is still there, this time saying she was born about 1861. And now there's a child, Jacob, that wasn't on the other census. He's about one year old, but he's not on the 1880 census 10 years later. So in analyzing this, we've got Ashby for the name. The parents' ages are much different than they were either in Family Search or in uh, the 1880 census. I felt the 1880 census was more accurate. And so ultimately, I'm going to tell the patron to use 1826 for Jeremiah's birth and 1840 for Susan's birth from the 1880 census because those seem to be more realistic. This makes them 33 years apart in age. It really makes Jeremiah old and he's gonna be almost 70 when he has Rosa. I don't think so. That 1812 is obviously off, okay. And then, of course, there's Jacob, who probably dies before 1880. So we've got an extra child to add into the family. So it's time to actually build a lesson now. So what I'm going to do is go over and click Create a Lesson. And I'm going to fill the lesson. And it has boxes for the title, the family being helped, the goal, and then the actual lesson plan. So I just said, title of the lessons, lesson one. That's the default that they put in here. Family being helped, Ashby family. The goal, add family members to the family of Jeremiah Ashby and submit them for temple work. Now to save your eyes, I've done a copy and paste of the bottom part. So, the first thing you do is you tell them how to find where you're at. And I'm so grateful that they have this as part of the lesson plan. In fact, there's actually a place back here 
where um, uh, I guess this is an older version. In the more modern version of this, there's a thing here that you can click on that will give you a path back from the patron to the person that you're on at that moment and actually build the path for you. I've learned to build my own. So I tell my patron to go, she's got to go find Jeremiah Ashby. So I said, go to your father and then go up his tree to Lula May Pelham. And then from her, go back to Rosa Anna Ashby. And I give them the ID number. So if they want to, they can just go straight to the ID number. Now, what are we going to do? First thing we're going to do is on the father's record. And this is one place I made a mistake. I should have said, and then go to her father, Jeremiah, because that's where we're really working. So on the marriage, there's a marriage hint for him. I said, note the last name is Ash, but, but that's okay. You may find the name is Ashby with a Y or an E or Ashba, but process the marriage hint. And then there's a hint for the 1880 census. So this is your family. And it said, note that Rosa's listed on this as one year old, but a record shows she was born in 1881. So that 1881 date appears to be an error. For now, don't add the child Julia from the census. Remember, this is that child that probably doesn't belong to Susanna, the mother. And she's probably a child of another wife and we'll deal with her later. Okay, now, because of the way family search is set up, she needs to do some editing. And so for Jeremiah, we're gonna change his date of birth to about 1826 and I don't know why I said Ohio here. It should, should be Indiana and then just change it to Indiana and Susanna change it to 1840 and Indiana. Then manually add a child to an unnamed wife of Jeremiah. In other words, we're gonna go up to Jeremiah and we're gonna say add a child and it's gonna be without the mother being Susanna, and you're going to add her by her ID because Julia is already in there. She's Julia Ann Ashba, and she has this ID number. And so, whoops, we can just go add her by ID where she's a child of Jeremiah without any wife's name. And she's in there with a husband and two kids, but she doesn't show the parents. Somebody's worked on the father's side. They got her name from the marriage, but they don't know who the parents are. And actually, this is one of those cases where that's fine because none of those four people had temple work done. So they're all gonna need temple work. We're getting some bonus names besides the children and the husband and wife, Jeremiah and Susanna, were getting Julia's husband and children. And then look for duplicates. And I said, there'll actually be one for their child, Phoebe. There's really a duplicate there where it says just Jeremiah and Susan. And Phoebe has, I think, just one ordinance done the parents don't have any ordinances to do because they're just names, but we need to clean it up. So we need to do some duplicates. So when we're all done and we've done this lesson together, and then we wait a couple of months, this is what the family looks like. We've got the mother and the father, and we've got the kids. And then somebody came along and put Ashba in for everybody's name changed them from Ashby to Ashba and decided Julia needed to be under Susanna and moved her out of the family where it's just Jeremiah, the father and no wife. So somebody went in and started messing the family up a little bit. But 
it really wasn't hard. You notice that we have full dates on people. I mean, we've got birth and death dates for everybody but Mary now in the family. And we never have found Jeremiah or Susanna's death records yet. But we put the family together enough to where we could send, do the temple work for it. And I have a nice paper trail so that I can go back in time and see where this came from. Okay, so in review, this lesson shows you how to use that con consultant planner, or now it's called the helper resources, and how to prepare a lesson doing find, take, teach, discover, gather, connect, whatever you wanna call it. And your challenge would be to try one of these out if you've never done it for yourself. Write up the lesson so you get familiar with how it goes on there. Be your own helper, in other words, because you show up in your own helper resources. So you can actually go in and plan a lesson for yourself just so you can see how it works. If you've never done this before, that's a good first step to get familiar with what you've got. So coming up soon, but it'll be a while, is we'll do another one of these lessons, but we'll do it with a descendancy situation using the descendancy report in family search. And we'll go out and find cousins to add. Now, upcoming while I'm thinking about it, before we get to questions, um, in two weeks, I think it's the 7th of July, the first Wednesday, uh, we're going to do a lesson on how to fix bad merges. You know, we had a lesson last month on merging. Now we're going to do the opposite and talk about restoring people and undoing bad merges with all the tips and suggestions. And you'll see several examples of how to deal with these things carefully and responsibly. And next month's gonna be a little different. I'm gonna be on the road. In fact, that lesson's gonna to come to you from Salt Lake because I'll be in Salt Lake that day. And the rest of the month, I have no idea where I'm gonna be. So the second lesson next month is just gonna be canceled. We're just gonna have one lesson next month on that first Wednesday no third Wednesday next month. Well, there is, but no lesson. Okay, so questions. Any questions, you probably have to unmute yourself. Questions about the lesson first, probably. Have I put you all to sleep? Well, they're not. I had some questions as to some of those who signed in. Is this a good time? Like Rob's iPhone, who is that? Did you unmute? Yeah. 